Good afternoon. Is this on? Oh, yeah, it's on. Well, welcome. Uh, it's great to see so many people here at this wonderful event that we're going to be hosting this afternoon. My name is Dave Chanda. I'm the director of New Jersey Fish and Wildlife, but I also have the privilege of serving as the president of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And uh, I have to tell you, I, I, I've been in the business for almost 40 years, and, and today marks one of the most exciting days that I've ever seen come down the pike and how it relates to uh, conservation and fish and wildlife management. You know, when I was coming over this morning, I, this afternoon, I was thinking, how am I going to open this thing? What am I going to say? I, I mean, if you look at this panel, who I'll introduce in a moment, you're talking about some of the biggest conservation leaders in this country, some of the most successful businessmen, the businesswomen that you would have ever, you know, met in your life. And here I am up here introducing this whole thing. And as, and as I'm driving down Pennsylvania Avenue, I look out the cab, and here's this mature bald eagle flying right down Pennsylvania Avenue. I mean, how cool is that? And I'm thinking, that's definitely a sign for what we're doing this afternoon. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it was heading towards the river to catch something. I, I don't think it was going to find anything on Pennsylvania Avenue. But it was just an incredible sighting. And as you're driving down the road like that and you look at all the people busy on the sidewalk, they don't even have an inkling as to what's flying above them. And of course, the appropriateness of that is, to me, that's one of the species that we're going to be talking about today. And it certainly represents a huge success story in wildlife management across this country. When I started my career back in early 1980, New Jersey had one nesting pair of bald eagles, one nesting pair. But we cobbled together the resources and the staff and the volunteers and our NGO partnerships to work hard on bald eagles. And I can tell you today, we have 100 90 nesting pairs of bald eagles in the state of New Jersey today. What an incredible success story, and it shows what you can do when you commit resources to something. And that's what this Blue Rim panel on sustaining America's wildlife diversity is going to be all about, and, and the exciting uh, opportunities that are going to be in front of us uh, as wildlife professionals to continue that kind of important work. So, so what I would like to do is just take a moment before I introduce the speakers and introduce the entire panel. I know some of them are here today, and I'd like you to at least raise your hand so folks in the audience can, uh, can recognize you and acknowledge your, your great work on this. First of all, our national co-chairs, who I'll introduce a little bit more in a moment, but you have John Morris and David Friedenthal, uh, who are two co-chairs. They did a wonderful job. Uh, I've been to almost every meeting but one. Some folks would take a group this large and kind of consider it like herding squirrels to try and keep the uh, uh, opinions all moving forward in a positive manner. A and you two folks did a great job, you know, keeping the dialogue going, keeping the group focused, and, and keeping them centered. So thank you for that. Now, the members of this panel, you had, uh, Kevin Butt, who's the Regional Environmental Director for Toyota Motor Engineering and Manufacturing. You had Richard Childress. I know Richard is here, CEO and Chairman of Richard Childress Racing Enterprises. He's also a board member of NRA. Jeff Crane, president of the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation. Jeff is to my left. Bruce Culpepper, the executive vice president, Shell America. John Doerr, president and CEO of Pure Fishing, Inc. Jim Falstick, who's the vice chair of Partners for Conservation and owner of Daybreak Branch, right here in front of me. John Fitzpatrick, the director of Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Greg Hill, president and COO of Hess Corporation. You have Becky Humphreys, the Executive Vice President of the National Wild Turkey Federation. You have Dr. Stephen Keller, Professor Emeritus from Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Dr. Keller. Jennifer Mull, CEO, Backwoods Equipment, Inc., President, Outdoor Industry Association. You have John Newman, board member, Ducks Unlimited. Mike Nussman, President and CEO of American Sport Fishing Association. And that's great that you're here. I believe you have a board meeting going on right now, don't you? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Awesome. Great for you. Thank you for being here. You have Margaret O'Gorman, the president of Wildlife Habitat Council. Glenn Olson, uh, uh, with the chair of the Bird Conservation Public Policy for the National Audubon Society. Thank you. Uh, Colin O'Mara, president and CEO of National Wildlife Federation, to my left. You have Connie Parker, the CEO. Uh, 12 North Capital LLC, board member of the Teddy Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. I know Connie's here. Charlie, Charlie Potter, CEO of Max McGraw Wildlife Foundation. 
Steve Sinetti, the President and CEO of the National Shooting Sports Foundation. John Tomke, the Chair, Wildlife and Hunting Heritage Conservation Council. Thank you for being here. Jeff Trandall, the Executive Director and CEO of the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. We have James Walker, the Board Vice Chairman, EDF Renewable Re Energy Board Member of the American Wind Wildlife Institute. Thank you. Steve Williams, the President of the Wildlife Management Institute. Thank you, Steve. And Bob Ziemer, who's the Director of the Missouri Department of Conservation, the great state of Missouri, as I understand it. And our ex officio members were Michael Bean, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Fish, Wildlife, Parks for the Department of Interior, and uh, Ron Reagan, who's our Executive Director of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And, and I am humbled to be in the presence of such great leaders, and I'd like everybody to just give them applaud for the work that they've done to this point. So it, it is now my great pleasure to, uh, to kick this off, and, and the first person that I would like to introduce and uh, come up and introduce to you uh, what this panel has done and, and what they're recommenda recommending and, and where it may take us to, and that would be uh, Governor Dave Friedenthal. Uh, he has served as the governor of the state of Wyoming from 2003 to 2011, U.S. attorney from 1994 to 2001. He's a former chairman of the Western Governors Association and the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact. He currently is the senior counsel at Crowell and Mooring, where he works on energy and natural resources. Uh, certainly as governor, Dave was known to be uh, for his bipartisan, working to resolve difficult natural resource issues, help create the Wildlife and Natural Resource Trust Fund. And I know that he and his wife, Nancy, they have four children. They live in Cheyenne, Cheyenne Wyoming. And I really enjoyed watching you uh, you know, work on this panel and, and offer your insight to things that will work and things that won't. And let me tell you, if Dave doesn't think it's going to work, he's going to tell the panel it doesn't work. So, Dave, thank you. Thank you. The, uh, the comment about squirrels leads to uh, observations about nuts and other things, all of which are entirely inappropriate for this gathering. But... Uh, for those of you on the committee who the description fits, you know who you are. Um, <laughs> uh, as you can tell from the outline of the members of the group, it's a fairly diverse group. I uh, was a little bit intimidated in that some of them had sued me when I was in office, and I had sued some of them when I was in office, and, and some of them I didn't know but figured if I did, I could sue them anyway. Um, <laughs> but I would say this. Um, the group was brought together under a premise initially from the... Uh, uh, state game and fish agencies that the idea was that uh, our job was to go find them money. Um, unfortunately, they gathered up a group of people who had fairly strong views about what the future ought to look like. And it fairly quickly moved into a very interesting discussion about um, really redefining how we support uh, the efforts to maintain uh, the diverse fish and wildlife population. And what became clear is that the traditional model of relying on um, uh, hunting and licensing fees and some Pittman-Robinson money really related to the, what, uh, what we affectionately call the hook and bullet crowd um, was not sufficient. And I know that from my own experience in Wyoming in that we're very proud of our agency, but the funding for that agency um, has really kept, um, it's done a very good job on the, on the managed animals, the game animals and the fishing and the fish uh, that, are, that are subject to uh, 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 picking up. But where it has had its stretches on the budget is when you begin to move beyond those species. As soon as you begin to place additional responsibilities, you end up with the guys who buy the hunting, guys and gals who buy the hunting and fishing license and saying, look, um, and I got a lot of this when we were doing wolves and bears in Wyoming, small but significant issue, uh, which unfortunately Bean's not here, I'd point out to him that someday you ought to get it solved. Um, <laughs> but what you discovered is people would come in and say, look, I'm paying an elk license or I'm paying for a deer license or a fishing license, what in the world am I doing supporting all of these other efforts? And the more caustic of them would say, Governor, you're using my license money the, that I put in for an elk or a moose to support a species who's out eating the same animal I want to hunt. And, you know, they joke about it, but the real problem is the money wasn't enough. You don't have enough money inside of the traditional um, managed species, trophy species and others, 
to support all of the things that the agencies are being asked to do now, uh, particularly as it relates to um, a whole range of species, some of whom uh, are potentially threatened or endangered, some of whom could be moving in that direction, and some of whom just happen to be species that people like, that they expect the Game and Fish Agency to deal with. So the issue really became fairly quickly, how do you move away from an expectation that we would fund what the Fish and Wildlife Agencies have always done to how do we focus it? And so it became focused on this question of uh, kind of the non-game species, uh, not just those that are threatened and endangered, but those that are, there's a general expectation on the part of the public that somebody's gonna look after them. I mean, nobody hunts metal arcs in Wyoming, but they're a big deal, they're the state bird. Um, you know, arguably they're covered by the Migratory Bird uh, Treaty Act, but um, having spent eight years as U.S. Attorney, we don't prosecute people for shooting metal arc, um, but we expect them to be there. And we expect the Game and Fish Agency to make sure that the habitat exists so that those birds are there so that we can hear them in the spring and remember that it's the state bird. And the stories in Wyoming are repeated every place in the country. There are species that are important to us because they're part of who we are in our state. They're part of what we want our children to hear. They're part of what we want our grandchildren to be able to enjoy. And it's simply not being supported adequately by the current funding sources. Hence, we arrived at the proposition relying on um, these annual plans that the agencies put together. And I gotta tell you, one of the things I learned in this is that I thought only the Wyoming Game and Fish Agency knew how to spend money like a drunken sailor. It turns out that all 50 of these states do. And if you throw in the territories, these sums are huge. Uh, so we're not able to meet everything that they want. But what we did do is end up with a proposal that we would suggest that 1.3 million be made available each year um, going forward to fund the efforts inside of the individual state game and fish agency plans focused, focused on the non-game species, focused on those species that could potentially be th become threatened or endangered or the species that are of special concern within that area. It still leaves for the individual agency the need for them to um, wisely use uh, the sportsman and sportswoman's dollars that they get but the idea is that, is, is that if you want to do something like this, that is, ask Congress for more money, you can't just come in and say, we want you know, new wine and old wineskins. You've got to tell them why. And the thing that really came out, and it was a couple of interesting exchanges. I'm from, a, obviously, an incredibly urban, populous state in uh, Wyoming. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but what was interesting is the people on the committee who are from a more urban area, um, which we consider Nebraska, but uh, <laughs> they had a very interesting perspective, which is how do they get a sort of wildlife or outdoor experience made available to people in urban areas? Not something we think a lot about in Wyoming. I mean, we worry about access to public lands and fighting with the federal government and railing on them and, and you know, but when you start to think about it, there's a whole other set of needs. So the idea is, is to allocate this funds pursuant to the existing formula to allow each of those agencies to develop something or to utilize that in a manner that is compatible with the area that they serve. We don't want it regulated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We don't need it overseen by Washington. Um, my only regret today is that they didn't bring me a bottle of water so that I could do either a Trump or a Rubio or something, um, but I'm still okay. If I get thirsty, I'll just get a drink. The point being, if you look at what we do in this country and what we treasure, a lot of it is the non-consumptive use of wildlife. If you're driving down the road in, in, out in the West, you love to see the animals. Or if you're in an urban area, and just as uh, he was saying, you know, here comes a bald eagle. You know, that is so remarkable, and it's something we treasure. But he didn't pay a penny for the privilege of seeing that. He didn't pay a penny for the uplift that that gave to his spirit. And we somehow have to recognize that no good in society is free. And so we're proposing that uh, uh, Congress support and look to, we earmarked or talked about initially uh, looking at the um, uh, income from federal mineral royalties. We're not talking about a new tax. And inevitably the question will come up about an offset and we'll end up talking about that. We'll leave that to Jeff and, and Kevin. Uh, but I will tell you, or to Colin, but I will tell you that I noticed in the last bill that our fine Congress passed and the president signed that all of this stuff about offset seemed to be about half a trillion dollars off. Now, where I come from, that's a lot of money, but it's a whole lot more than 1.3 billion. So when people get righteous with me about, oh, we can't do this because you don't have an offset, you know, 
perhaps they should look at the hem of their own robe. It's a bit uh, soiled by the way they conduct business. So I don't buy that argument. What I do buy is that this, this need is very real, that we as citizens need to step up and try to get it funded, and that there's a mechanism to make sure that it is utilized on the ground in the context of the particular area that will be used. I suspect in Wyoming we're going to do things that will be different um, than they might do in Kansas City or, or uh, um, I, I just, it just will be and that's okay. But the principle is sound and the principle is that America has something to treasure. We have something to value and we have something to pass on to the next generation but we have to recognize that it's not free and that the revenues generated by sportsmen and sportswomen are insufficient to meet that need, and so we suggest that uh, we have a proposal to do that. I'd like to introduce my co-chair, the ever, the ever brilliant and eloquent conscience of the committee, um, John Morris, who, uh, um, and the reason I say that is very specific. Towards the end of the gathering, I'd said, I don't want to do this anymore, because um, uh, we'd finished and our report was done. And here comes little Mr. Conscience, Jiminy Cricket, um, <laughs> otherwise known as, uh, Johnny Morris, and he knows, because I'd already told him what I want to do, he gets up and makes an impassioned plea. And of all things to do is to bring up your grandkids. He starts talking about your grandkids, and of course Nancy and I now have five, and they're the apple of our eye, and I consider that really low. <laughs> really low. Um, in part because uh, my son just had twin boys, and our discussion now is about which of the guns they get. Now, um, their mother's not quite there yet with us, but she'll get there. But John, for you to do that reflects uh, the wisdom that you brought to the committee and its deliberations. So, ladies and gentlemen, John Morse. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everybody. I, I brought a prop with me today I'm pretty proud of. It was a gift I received this morning. I was lucky to travel up here today with uh, our director of conservation, uh, one of the two, Mark McDonald from Springfield, Missouri, our home, and with our director of conservation, Bob Zemer. Rob Keck is here with us too that helps our company, but it's a crest of the Missouri Department of Conservation. And it's really, to me, it's just, uh, he, he brought this for me, not, and, and I thought, man, I gotta use this, because this is really what today's all about. It's our state agencies and the unbelievable important role they've played in our country historically as we look to the future to manage our fish and wildlife and all of our natural resources. And our, just our hats are off to all of you for all you do. I look around the room, I see a lot of directors here. And uh, so and Bob was telling me that, uh, reminding me the Missouri Department of Conservation came into being uh, right at 80 years ago. And I thought about my parents, my mom and dad were both born in Missouri in 1911, a little town Willard. And my dad would tell me, he said, John, uh, my dad, my mom was our best fisherman. My dad, he loved bird hunting, quail hunting. But he said, John, in my lifetime, I've come become a huge fan of the Missouri Department of Conservation. And he said, I've come to understand uh, reaching older period in life, how critically important conservation is. And he just told me stories and my sisters about when he grew up that you couldn't see any wild turkeys around home. And uh, he never did see a white tailed deer till later on in life. So today is really about saluting and trying to lend support to these agencies that are so important to our country and to the quality of life that we have in America. I just uh, thank you, Dave. And Ron and Governor for <clears throat> your humor and for keeping us all on a straight line on trying to uh, have some significant impact on the task we are presented with. And I join them. I just want to say myself personally what an honor it's been to be asked to participate alongside the panel members. Uh, look out and see Richard Childers, Steve Wilson, the, every, everybody here that's a member of this panel. You folks are without question, it was mentioned, I'll just underscore, uh, not just your serving on this panel, but for years, many of you, how you've made conservation and managing future fish and wildlife a priority in your life. 
and people like Colin over there, a young man, one of the most brilliant minds I've ever been around. He could have made his career Wall Street, pursued, like most of these people, other endeavors. Maybe there is more financial rewards for them if they did so. But they chose to dedicate a lot of their life and their energy. This panel's been working now for over a year and a half, and almost every single one of them hasn't missed a meeting. They've put a lot of their time and energy and thought into trying to address the tasks we were challenged with. And um, I think one of the first things all of us would like to say to you here from the press and maybe uh, legislators and other individuals that are concerned and organizations concerned about conservation, we thank you for being here today and helping to spread the word on uh, what we are trying to accomplish here. Um, coming here today, it's really hard to think of anything much more important in the future of our country than the health of our fish and wildlife resources and, and what it does mean just to our, our culture and our family lifestyle and our happiness and our health. I mean, it's, it's hugely important. And uh, we, we all feel so strongly uh, about these things. Uh, my home state of Missouri isn't the only state that has a big impact from these agencies uh, and the tasks they face in managing fish and wildlife. When I was asked to serve on this panel, I just jumped at the chance because I've been, been around, you know, it's kind of our company's obligation and mine personally to be involved or try to give back to conservation. And I've been a big fan of the work the agencies uh, do and how, and come to realize pretty much how important that is. What I was very naive about is what the governor spoke to was the really uh, severe hardship or almost like a crisis mode financially that many of our state agencies face to continue to be able to do the work that they do and that they've done so well. A lot of this is impacted because they're being asked to do more and more than what they traditionally were charged with just managing like important things for game species and fish like for fish hatcheries and managing for whitetail deer and wild turkey all these things we're also caring as a country about um, all critters and the listing and of threatened and endangered species animals and the costly burden of this being you know uh, given to our state agencies to deal with and to manage, it's not without a great deal of expense. And that's what was alarming to me personally coming into this, that I just was not aware of the dire straits of many of our state agencies and what they mean to us, what they mean to our country, and they're waking up and where's their money to do all that they've done in the past, plus what we're asking to do and what, what is important for us to do as a country going forward in the future. So when you look at historically a lot of the funding, where it's come from for these agencies, in our home state of Missouri, we have a design for conservation. We, our department receives funding from a general revenue uh, sales tax statewide that our citizens voted quite a few years ago, they felt conservation was so important, we voted in a tax that was earmarked one-eighth to one percent of general sales tax that goes to our department, and that generates about a hundred million a year to help them do their work, plus or minus, but it's significant. But today, you know, looking at funding, uh, it's not very easy to go raise and ask people for, are they going to vote to have another tax or to pay another tax? Another source of funding, traditional source of funding for most of our state agencies, as the governor mentioned, but just to underscore it, it's been an excise tax that a number of people aren't even aware of on all sporting goods, uh, principally hunting gear, fishing gear, 10 or 11 percent federal excise tax that goes back to our states. And between that and just the sale of hunting and fishing license, that has represented and represents today a very significant part of our state's funding to do their work. And it's just not enough. It's just not enough, and we can't rob away from uh, the game species to, to uh, take care of non-game species. So 
I think the panel's main task uh, that we were all charged with is trying to find a solution, a financial solution to this, so we could put in place more permanent long-term funding uh, to, the, to support this important work of the states. And I think the good news is, uh, as we see it, though it's a challenging task, uh, there are some savvy people on this panel that deal with legislation, work in Washington quite often, that have a realistic approach to this in the government. And the panel has identified and we're recommending that kind of an allocation of a tax that's already being collected, an ener energy tax, energy exploration tax, a portion of that be allocated for our states to help manage these species. And Colin and others can talk to that, but we think if we, with your help, can get the word out, it's a very wise use of these funds that are already being collected. And we're just grateful to everybody uh, for being here with us today. It's been an honor to be a part of this, and uh, we think we're on the verge of something that's so needed here, and there's a simple, straightforward uh, answer at hand. So thanks for your help. We'll get her done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for those words. Uh, the report, by the way, is on everybody's chair. Uh, if you'd like to make sure you take a copy with you, uh, asking for, uh, you know, the need, fulfilling the need of the $1.3 billion that it's going to take to do the job at hand. I, I do have to tell you that, uh, you know, attending all of the meetings that this panel had was, was always very interesting because with your two co-chairs, you have one that came out of the business community, another that's more savvy with politics. One was ready to hit the ground running from day one and wanted Richard Childress driving the car because he only knew one speed and that was like 120 miles an hour. And the other was saying, oh, wait a minute, you can't go to Congress that way. So the two of them kind of made it work, which was really fun to watch. Um, you know, both very, very uh, smart gentlemen that are gonna help guide the path forward for us and, and we, we really, really, uh, truly uh, need that. Uh, by the way, I probably didn't introduce it, but at the end we will have a question and answer session. Um, I probably was neglecting my duties of not doing what Mark asked me to, so we will have an opportunity to address everybody's questions on this. Um, I, I do think the one thing I want to point to uh, that, that's come out of this is some of the recent events out west, and that's the work that was done with the sage grouse. I think the sage grouse is a great example of where this panel is trying to take us. And, and you think about, here's a species that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was about to list. And we all know what happens when something gets listed. We know what it means to the economy, to businesses that want to work in that area. And you take a look at what happened when those western states all got together with, with the energy folks, oil, wind, wind energy, with the NGOs, with the state partners, raised a tremendous amount of money and put huge, large landscape level conservation on the ground to at least start us back in the right direction on sage grouse. And as a result, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service did not list sage grouse. That's what this is all about. There are 1,600 some species that are out there listed. If we can get them off of the list, it's good for everybody. It's good for wildlife, it's good for the economy, it's good for the people that wanna do something on that land, whether you want to build a house in the right location, it's going to be a great thing to happen. So we need to get more species off the list and stop it from happening. You know, I need that 190 nesting pairs of eagles in New Jersey because one pair was a real pain in the butt to try and protect and manage and keep there forever. Now 190 pair, we're in pretty good shape, and that's where we need to, need to take this to. So how are we going to get there, and, and what are some of the opportunities? And, and two of the, the panel leaders that have had uh, some really great insight on where we can take this or, or how we get there are, are both Jeff Crane, who's the president of the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, and Colin O'Mara, who's the president and CEO of the National Wildlife Federation. And I think next on the agenda, I, I believe those two are going to tag team us and, and just, just give you some thoughts on opportunities that they see out there. So Jeff, Colin, thank you.
Well, thank you, Dave, and thank you all for, for coming. Um, it truly was a, a humbling experience to have the opportunity to work with the governor and Johnny and Ron's vision for putting this all together. Um, there's never a good time to propose new spending in Washington. But I want to actually take you back 80 years um, to 1937, when the economy was still in shambles. We're coming out of the Great Recession. And sportsmen from across the country came together to say, you know what? If we tax ourselves, we can restore the wildlife populations we all care about. And over the next 80 years, we saw the recovery of the white-tailed deer. We saw the recovery of the wild turkey. We saw the recovery of the elk. We saw the, we saw the recovery of a whole range of game species, a truly remarkable experience led by sportsmen. Now, the problem is that 20 years later, they actually figured out that you could do the same thing for fish. So Dingle Johnson, a, bill, a, a piece of legislation that created a small excise tax for on fishing tackle to allow us to fund conservation of fish. The problem is we don't actually hunt or fish most species in this country. So we never actually funded the rest of the puzzle. So you have all kinds of fish, wildlife, native plants that really don't have any kind of funding at all. And so we were charged with trying to figure out, given the current pol political dynamics, what are solutions that could actually address this overwhelming need? And fortunately, state agencies across the country have developed very detailed plans for how they would go about conserving wildlife species across the board to, to, to protect the full diversity. The problem is there's only 40 to $60 million a year allocated for all 50 states and territories in DC together to share for those purposes. And so you're only able to conserve a handful of number, a, a small number of the total species that are at risk. And there are thousands of species that are at risk. And so Jeff and I have spent a lot of time with our teams over the last few months talking to Republicans and Democrats. And the interesting thing is that when we start talking about the need, no one on either side is pushing back. When we start talking about why it makes sense to do collaborative, proactive, voluntary measures on the front end at the state level, rather than having expensive emergency room recovery actions on the back end that are much more restrictive and much more, much more costly, folks get it. Now, there's questions about where the money's going to come from, but as the governor said, if you can pass any kind of tax cut without paying for it, I'm not sure why we can't figure out innovative ways to pay for things like this. But the message that we're delivering is not only can we save thousands of species with this level of investment. Not only can we start pulling folks together to find collaborative local solutions rather than litigious solutions that wind up in the courts for decades, but we can also create a lot more regulatory certainty because folks won't have to worry about potential listings because fish, fish and wildlife populations will be more abundant. And we can have a stronger economy to support the $650 billion, so the B, billion dollar outdoor recreation economy of which Bass Pro Shops is obviously a huge part. And so you put those pieces together, I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat, I don't care if you're from the West or the East, that's a home run. So the idea of having a stronger economy, a healthier environment, healthier species, and getting more kids outdoors, because we have a crisis right now in this country where, not, where folks aren't connected with nature, what better way to connect kids with nature than having species kind of repopulating the landscape? And so we were in offices this morning talking to Democrats and Republicans. We're going to let those members announce for themselves their support of this in the coming weeks. Um, but the support has been pretty strong. And I think it's because it's this, this is this, there's this conservation piece that's really just been lacking for 80 years since we started this conversation with Pittman Robertson and then with Diggle Johnson. This is the third piece of the triangle. And if we can get this piece done, we will do incredible things for wildlife. And I can't say enough about my good friend Jeff Crane here, the head of the Congressional Sportsman Foundation, um, who's been working hard in some very tough terrain right now. And folks, you know, they don't want another program. They don't want, you know, any more spending. But this makes sense. And they like the idea of the states being empowered. They like the idea of local collaboration being, being prioritized rather than, rather than regulatory measures coming out of Washington. Um, but together, we've been going around. You know what? This is an idea whose time has come. It's been talked about since 1980. There's been two or three bites of this apple. This is different because we have business leaders that are saying the same things. You have the oil and gas industry. You have the outdoor rec industry. You have the finance sector all saying that we need a better way, that there is a better way. And it's frankly giving the resources of folks on the ground at the local level to make conservation collaborative and not litigious once again. So with that, let me bring up my friend Jeff Crane. Thank you. Um, Benton clean up on the summary of this, so we identified the problem. I think we all know that it uh, exists. We came up with a solution, and just in fairness, both of these two crafty guys decided that since our solution was gearing towards a congressional ass, they volunteered me to be the guy that have to lead this subcommittee, which I appreciate. Uh, so I immediately volunteered my buddy here to, to be my co-lead because everyone knows it's lonely when you're out there on your own and it's nice to have a, to have a buddy up there. But uh, so we have a, so we have a, um, we have a solution uh, and we have a pretty good sales pitch about where we're going to go about it. 
Now all we need to do is figure out where in the heck $1.3 billion annually is going to come from. Because even in Washington, $1.3 billion is still a lot of money. Uh, and so to go to Congress, the only way you're going to do this, um, you know, Congress, as I think all of us know, can find a lot of reasons to gridlock on a lot of stuff. Uh, and it seems like more and more the only things that they're actually willing to do is when we're right at the precipice trying to fall over the edge and then they have to do something. But I think conservation um, is something that they can rally around. Uh, being the head of the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, we get to work with the largest bipartisan caucus on Capitol Hill, the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus, uh, with nearly 300 members in the House and the Senate. And the, the reason that they can get along and we can move legislation is because we all believe that conservation knows no political bounds. Um, it's good. It's part of the soul of America. It's a resource. Uh, it's part of our wealth that all of us as, as American citizens get to, to own and enjoy. And so um, to make this sales pitch, we've got to go uh, and, and make it bipartisan. We've got to make it bicameral. We need a Senate and a House uh, component of these um, things. This isn't going to be easy. Um, this is a big ask. It's a lot of money. We've identified a revenue source, which doesn't involve new taxes, but for the fiscal conservatives in particular, they're looking at that money and being redirected away from deficit reduction to go into specific programs. But we're selling it on federalism. We're selling it on an investment that's going to save taxpayers money, which resonates really well. Uh, and as Colin has correctly said, we're really close, I think, to getting uh, a handful of these members in both the House and the Senate to say yes. We don't want to steal their thunder because I think if they're going to introduce the bill, they, they ought to have the, uh, the ability to, to have that opportunity. Uh, and we're going to work it. And we're going to work at this Congress. And we're going to use uh, all of us, um, whether you're like me and like a fishing rod and a, and a shotgun, or whether you're just riding a bike or paddling a canoe, uh, these are all our great outdoors. And we need to get ahead of this train and get this sorted out. And Congress is the only way that we're going to be able to do it because of the size of the uh, of the of that dollar nut that needs to be invested in this. And, and that's what we're going to sell. So we're all going to be looking to all of you. Um, this isn't the first time we've done this. We came really close uh, to passing something called the Conservation and Reinvestment Act 15 years ago, really close, uh, which was along that had some of these same tenets to it. State wildlife grants are passed. Um, the Teaming with Wildlife Coalition that's here in town, 6,000 groups um, from consumptive to non-consumptive getting together and rallying around this. So we've got the groundswell. We've got the grassroots supports. We're going to work with uh, some of the other folks in the room to, to motivate Congress. Uh, and I think we can get it done. So with that, uh, Dave, I think i am covered our part here. Thank you. So it, it occurred to me as the, the presentations were going and Mr. Morris was up here speaking, I'm, I'm sure most of you know Mr. Morris, but I don't think that uh, you know all of, you know, of, of what he's committed and what he's done for us. So I, I, I do want to just take a moment to, to, for those of you that live in a cave and maybe don't know this, but Johnny's the founder of Bass Pro Shops. And he started that business, this is incredible to me, started that business as a small tackle shop in his father's liquor store in Springfield, Missouri. And now, today, his stores are visited by more than 116 million people a year. 116 million people a year. Think about the outreach opportunity right there. My goodness. Uh, Johnny's also the founder of Tracker Marine Group, which has produced the number one selling brand of fishing boats for more than 35 years. And I think more relevant to the conservation story that we're talking about today, he's deeply committed to, committed to conservation, and he's the past recipient of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies Citizen Conservation Award which is the highest honor that we give to somebody like that. Very humble person, and I don't think that was brought out in his uh, comments to us, so I think that certainly helps put it a little bit into perspective for us. So thank both Johnny and Dave for your leadership in getting us to this point. Now, this also brings us almost to the point of question and answer, but I do want to make one short announcement. Uh, 
you know, I, I serve on the executive committee of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. There are about another 13 directors that do so. We, uh, we huddled together at a, a meeting last week, and uh, we've reworked our budget, and we have instructed Ron to jumpstart this event or this uh, attempt. We're going to put $125,000 right out front so that we can hire a program manager. We know that there are still a whole bunch of Blue Ribbon panel members that want to kind of, you know, stay engaged with this and, and help us move forward. So we're going to circle back with those folks to figure out what this campaign looks like. Who do we need to bring into this campaign? Is it going to be just a lobbying effort? Is it a coalition building? And, uh, you know, that's going to get us started. And we know that's just the starting point. We know that we've got a lot of NGO partners out there that are going to also bring uh, both time and resources to the table. And, uh, you know, Director Zemer and I are also personally beating the living daylights out of every other state director in the country to make sure they bring forward more resources so that if we're going after this, let's go after it and make sure we're doing it right. So, you know, we're going to get out of the gate quickly. We're going to bring that person on. We're going to circle back with all the professionals that have some really good ideas on, on how we make this happen. We'll certainly be soliciting the advice of our co-chairs and uh, both Colin and uh, on Jeff on how to make this happen. But I think we're at a good place. I think we're at a good time. I think from, you know, just, a, just what it means economically to if we're successful, it's money that is going to be wisely invested by our government if we get there. So with that, I want to thank everybody for attending. I want to, again, thank the panel members for all the time that you put into this, our two co-chairs who did such a great job, you know, leading the effort to bring us to this point. We really enjoy seeing so many people here. There is another event at the Hart Building tonight, um, 6 o'clock, Ron, that uh, you're more than welcome to come join us as we celebrate uh, what's in front of us. Like I said, this is something that only comes around once in the career of many of, of us as respective professionals in the field of wildlife management. We need to go at it with everything we've got to make this happen. So with that, I want to thank everybody for coming, but we will now go into questions and answers from anybody in the audience that might have, or if there's a member of the panel that would like to offer some comments before those questions come, we would welcome it. We have microphones moving around, so before you offer your comments, make sure the microphone is in your hands so that everybody can hear your question or your comment. So thank you. Questions, questions comments? These guys couldn't have done that good of a job to make sure that everything is totally covered and answered, correct? <laughs> but you see, John was very nice to me about that, and what was the look that I got from the governor? Because you state employees are all the same. Right over here, yes. Why $1.3 billion? Uh, I, I don't know if you want me to speak on behalf of the panel, but the panel members, I think Colin mentioned that uh, as a part of the state wildlife grant program, which is going on right now, Congress mandated that every state wildlife agency develop a wildlife action plan. And that information is all available on every state. It identifies all of the species that are at risk that could be heading for federal listing, that you know, if we don't do something about it, they're going to be in trouble. And uh, you know, that represents probably about two-thirds of what it would take to implement all of those action plans across the entire country. Hi, Tom Bigford, American Fishery Society. Uh, I appreciate the conversation, the focus on uh, avoiding or uh, delisting, trying to manage those 1,600 species that are already listed. But I think avoiding listings, like what happened with sage grouse, is a, almost a stronger story. Are both the protection and the restoration going to be uh, given equal consideration here for the 1.3 and for the yeah, activities? I, as you might imagine, I have some opinions on sage grouse. Um, <laughs> The, uh, yeah, you were afraid of this, weren't you? <laughs> Most of which I'll keep to myself. Um, much of the emphasis is on this question of avoiding listing because the delisting process is nearly impossible. Um, I mean, I've been through it with, uh, with grizzlies and wolves. Um, my guess is they'll put out another order here next week on, on grizzlies, and you know, so it all gets litigated, and so you're right. The, the better effort is to do it um, uh, preemptively. One of the reasons I believe in this panel is we spent a lot of money as the state that sort of led the charge on how you're going to deal with the sage grouse uh, with the core area strategy and the rest of it and I hope that we do more of that on other species but I think the part that I would caution people about is it can get hijacked 
by the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the land management agencies to where they went from uh, how do you avoid a listing to how do you manage an entire sage grouse or sagebrush habitat. And so, um, you know, one of the things, one of the things that you talk about is that if you're going to use that money properly, you have to keep it focused on what your goal is, which is to avoid a listing. But if it gets hijacked by the feds, it turns into how do we plan 11 states that we've been dying to plan, and you use the ESA as an excuse. So I think the importance of figuring out how to avoid a listing or the threat of a listing, because remember, um, they went through that process. There were a number of petitions filed. We litigated it. Uh, Judge Windmill said, you know, but for what Wyoming done has done, we would have listed it. They had so many years, what, three years to have the other states get engaged. Most of them did. Um, and then along comes the Fish and Wildlife Service. So I guess my point is you need to do this very, very early so that you don't get to the state of a potential listing. A potential listing can unleash as much fury as a listing uh, given the way that they're being treated today because people then begin to look at something that's potentially listable as either sensitive uh, species and all of a sudden you're in the same quagmire. So. We don't need to get into the discussion about whether ESA works or not. I actually think it's pretty good. We just kind of tinker with it. But I think the, the, the issue that you raise is we need to move early. But you need to move early enough that you never get to a potential listing. Um, because once you're in that process, that thing is just, um, I mean, it takes on a life of its own. So if we can figure out a way that people move quickly enough on those species, so that you don't end up with all the petitions for listing and all the litigation and the rest of it goes with it. Because once that goes on, the scientists are no longer in control. Uh, all of a sudden, it is a political issue as opposed to a scientific issue. But other than that, I'm entirely neutral on all yeah. of these questions. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other? Uh... Just one quick follow-up. Is, is there any reason why you wouldn't now, uh, the fingers are pointed at the collective us. We have to do what we said we were going to do to, to remedy the, the population, you know, improve the population so that five years from now, the population doesn't warrant another petition and people don't come back to us and say, you had a chance and you didn't do what you said you were yeah, going to right. do. So yeah. it's yeah. almost yeah. A, a more imperative urgency to succeed now than it was before. Well, and it's more immediate than that. I mean, the litigation has been filed in Montana to essentially unwind, unwind what Fish and Wildlife has done. So, um, you know, it, it is, uh, you know, when your kids were little, we all read them the never-ending story, and I'm afraid sage grouse is kind of like that. So, so the only thing I would add to that is a state Fish and Wildlife director, and I know there are at least another dozen or so in the audience that would, would reinforce what I'm about to state, is I think that the state agencies have demonstrated time and time again that when we put the resources to what you're asking us to do, that we do see success. Now, sometimes it's not going to happen in five years. We didn't bring our bald eagles back in New Jersey in five years. That was a 20-year long commitment, and sometimes that's difficult because there are some folks in government that only want to think three months, six months out. But I, I think the track record is there in every state fish and wildlife agency across the country to, to show that we can do what you just asked of us. I understand we have a question uh, online. We do have a question from Paul Smith from Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Please proceed. Yes, thank you. Uh, would you please describe what it will take from Congress to make this $1.3 billion appropriation? Uh, is it uh, a bill that needs to be written and passed through the House and the Senate, or uh, just please describe what the process will be like? Uh, first of all, it's not, it wouldn't be an appropriation. I think the way we envision it is a permanent authorization into an existing account uh, in the, the trust fund that's there, uh, and we are envisioning asking for existing royalties. 50% of it from offshore royalties and 50% from onshore royalties to fund this uh, amount every single year. Uh, it would be delegated back out to the states or apportioned back out to the states in the same manner that the existing um, excise tax dollars that, that, that uh, the governor and, and John Morris talked about on fishing equipment and on uh, firearms and ammunition. So the, the states are familiar with it. 
uh, and then the states would be the ones that would actually uh, be able to direct it to those species of needs and those areas of concern. So it would be permanent authorization off of existing royalties. Yes, it would take uh, standalone legislation to do that. Um, the question of the offset was raised earlier. Uh, Washington has got a, a way of being able to find offsets. Um, and so why, while $1.3 billion uh, is certainly, again, not an insignificant amount, um, there, there are ways to, to create offsets for it. Uh, and I think it's, it's very reasonable. Uh, as Dave mentioned at the beginning, some of the oil and gas leaders were on our panel or are on our panel. Uh, and recognize this as a good investment off of the off of the monies that they already pay in royalties. Thank you. Um, so for the folks that are on the phone, that was Jeff Crane with the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation. Um, and, and I guess I would just ask that uh, we do recognize ourselves if it's yeah. if it's coming on the phone. I mean, the, the folks in the room, we've all you know gone through our introductions, but that way it'll help any of the reporters that are uh, that are out there and about the country. Other questions? I'm Jay Mackinich with the Archie Trade Association. There's been users' taxes bantied about for years, and that's frankly what the firearms and archery tax is. The thing that I think within the industry, and John knows this, that gets talked about a lot, is the vast majority of hunting equipment is not taxed. People don't know that. Um, blinds, in our case, blind street hands, camel clothing, boots, a lot of the stuff that is sold in stores is not taxed. So there's a lot of discussion inside the industry about where will they go next and will there be any other user taxes. Did the idea of user taxes on those still closely vested in hunting and fishing come up? And if so, are you willing to share where that yeah. went? Obviously, you ended up in a different place, which will resonate pretty well within our industry group, but there's still some in that group who look at others that play in the same arena that they do and wonder uh, if, if, if the, that might be the next step. It was, uh, it was discussed. Um, we looked at some numbers, talked about it, and uh, the conclusion was reached that um, uh, that's a hornet, hornet's nest we didn't need to hit. Uh, and let's go to an existing uh, revenue source rather than create a new one. And uh, there is not any contemplation. I mean, it, we'd, we'd have been uh, irresponsible not to have looked at it, but it made no sense. And so uh, we went to this other source as a place to go, um, in part because of the, the emphasis on um, uh, potentially listed species and their impacts on the economy. That, so you really, um, it may take 20 years, but it'll be a significant benefit to the people who currently fund uh, the federal minimum royalty pot. So it was looked at but rejected, and uh, I didn't see any indication. I mean, Johnny wanted to pay it all himself, but we <laughs> said, nah, no. We didn't, uh, and, and frankly, uh, uh, the, the drive to not include it was not led by the people from the industry, but really by others who said, look, um, uh, there's already a tax, and, and, and we were aware of the fact that within the industry, some people think other people in the industry ought to be, uh, you know, and, and uh, that's a lot like being a policeman showing up at a domestic violence dispute. You just assume not, and uh, uh, so we just left it. I would say, too, just to expand on that, a lot of times our own company, other vendors, people in the, within the industry, and our customers, if it's demonstrated there is a specific use, you know, that's how we have some of the taxes we have today, and like the sale of trout stamps in Missouri to fund our hatcheries, people know where that money's going, that pays big dividends, they don't mind it, but when we looked at this, we said it's too much, like the governor said, too much of a, an uphill battle. And then two, the, the incremental funds that would be raised through this relative to the need, there was a big gap there. So it, we don't envision any pursuing the tax within the industry right now. Thank you. So for our outdoor writers and uh, newspaper reporters that are on remote, that was our two co-chairs, Governor Friedenthal and John Mars, that responded to that question. Is there another? You folks really just want to get to the refreshments, don't you? All the way over here. Thanks, Whit Fosberg, the uh, Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. Sort of a tie-on to Jay's question. John, you talked about the Missouri sale tax, uh, one-eighth of one percent, I believe, that generates $100 million annually for 
non-game conservation and other things in that state. Is there any discussion about a, the state's role in this in terms of providing revenue? Uh, similar incentives to have other states do what Missouri has done to create dedicated funding streams to pay for this also, so that it's not just the feds in doing this right now. Good. No. Thanks, Whit. The, um, the, so the idea of using Pittman-Robertson as the model um, with requiring the state match um, will require, states will have to come up with their share. And I think you know some states might be able to do that with general funds. Other states might have to be creative. Um, I do think Missouri has been a leader in this for a long time. And as a former state agency head, um, I was always envious of Bob and his team for having those resources. Um, but there's got to be shared commitment. And there has to be involvement at the state. Because if, if you get someone for free, you're unlikely to uh, maybe treat it with the same level of respect. And um, I think that's where I think that's why maintaining that balance that's really worked well for 80 years between the state share and the federal share helps to become a model that um, continues to stay strong. We do. We do have another call remotely. Yes, we do have a question from Bruce Scruton from New Jersey Herald. Please proceed. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, the 1.3, how is that envisioned to be divvied up? Is it population? So Dave, Dave's group gets a lot more money than Wyoming, or is it on space <laughs> and Wyoming gets I a like lot it. more than New Jersey? Um, or is it uh, based on these wildlife uh, plans that are in existence and the state's adding to them? It's based on level of virtue and Wyoming gets it all. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there's a formula in one of you guys. There is. Explain. Bruce, this is Dave Chanda, the director of New Jersey Fish and Wildlife. And, uh, you know, what, what the panel had looked at is the sub-account that's already existing that it would be put in place has an existing formula on how it would be divided amongst the 50 states and territories. And it's basically uh, based upon the size of the state uh, and population size is taken into consideration. There's a minimum and then there's a maximum that a state can receive. So if, if the panel succeeds, the minimum a state would receive is roughly $13 million a year. I think the maximum is about $65 million, and, and it's all based upon a uh, you know, formula that takes into consideration size and population density. You have over here. Hi, I'm Mary Klein. I'm president of NatureServe. And um, I just have two comments and a question. I want to really thank the panel for recognizing the magnitude of this problem and, and putting a stake in the ground in a, in a way that I hope raises people's awareness of how desperately underfunded these activities have been and what a risk that poses to the country's future and its economy. Um, and I want to thank uh, those of you, a couple of you have mentioned how the, the plans can drive, the state wildlife action plans can drive a focus and a rallying around what to, to protect and where we're going to invest these resources. Um, if you could speak a little bit to maybe the, the experience from Pittman Robertson and Dingle Johnson funding of how the states can pull together um, and reinvigorate the Teaming with Wildlife Coalition to be that, that big partnership uh, that that works together to solve this by rallying around the plans. I'd appreciate hearing more about your thoughts about sort of how this money can galvanize a broader uh, constituency beyond just the state agencies. The, um, no, thanks for the, Mary, thanks for the question. The, you know, in, in 1937, when the coalition came together to pass Pippin Robertson, it wasn't just sportsmen, right? You had the you had the birders, you had the forester, forest stewards, you had the farmers, you had the garden clubs, you had the 4-H clubs, and the idea was that all these individual entities that cared about wildlife um, should really advocate for solutions, and that was a big part of the founding of the National Wildlife Federation and the state affiliates that we that we support. And you know, today, um, because sportsmen have funded conservation for the most part in this country. I mean, 80 to 90% of the, of the money we had for wildlife in Delaware was coming from sportsmen. Um, not, all, not all kind of parts of that coalition have had, both the, have both the contribution as well as the responsibility and the ownership of some of those resources. And so the sportsman role has to be prime in many ways um, because they have funded conservation. And we have to make sure that their primacy of the dollars that they've been spending is always there. Um, but at the same time, we need the rest of those voices. And the state wildlife, the state wildlife action plans are actually a, a wonderful place where the best 
the best conservation minds from the state, both inside the agencies and conservation groups and sportsmen and birders and other groups and scientists and academics come together to build these wonderful plans. And so the thought is if there were sufficient resources to implement those plans with that level of public engagement, not just in the planning process, but the actual implementation, you could rebuild that conservation coalition that Ding Darling and Teddy Roosevelt and others envisioned that would blur these lines between consumptive and non-consumptive. And at the end of the day, we might have different reasons for going out. Somebody might want a bird, somebody might want to look at birds, somebody else might want to shoot birds. But at the end of the day, we all care about healthy habitat, we all care about healthy plants, we all care about healthy species populations. And I think this effort, while never detracting from the role of sportsmen and making that you know, central, can actually bring together a coalition, get us back to the point where we conserve our resources in a collaborative way, in a way that actually brings people together and not in this litigious, kind of paralyzed, sclerotic world that we're in right now where it's easier to sue somebody than to talk to somebody. And I think this could be a huge step in that direction. Hi, I'm Ken Parada. I'm the uh, conservation editor for NWTF and Turkey Country Magazine. And just a, a question about the $1.3 billion. H how is that money being used today? Is that just general treasury money? It's so, you, you mentioned deficit reduction, so it's not fenced or anything. It's, it's, there's about $12 billion annually that comes in from a combination of the different royalties onshore and offshore that's just going into the general fund. Um, that money is earmarked for general fund to the Treasury for deficit reduction. So that would be 10 percent of it or so is what we're talking about and trying to take that, take that and redirect it. A lot of that. That money is not even being invested today. I mean, uh, spent today, the 1.3, to address these issues we're talking about. It would be some incremental money, part of it for preventative medicine to avoid these listings and other issues. Others? Yeah, Max Peterson, retired executive vice president of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. I'm delighted to see this effort. I have been a party to some efforts that succeeded and some that failed, and I'm really counting on this one to succeed. I'd like to see about a 10-point action plan, about 10 things that all of us that are interested could, could all grab on to and try to move this forward. I think the time is right, and I'd sure like to see it succeed. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Max, just from all of us, we salute you. You are a true hero in conservation in America. You're amazing. Thanks for being here. We would have saluted you earlier. I didn't see you. We also have your address, so we'll be in touch about those 10 <laughs> points. Any others? While well, we're looking for others, are there any panel members that would like to offer some thoughts? Yeah, Andre. Dave, before you get to that, let me just to, one, to Max's point, one thing that I do think is important to make clear is that we're not talking about rating any of the existing you know, money that's for conservation. And this is fully supportive of like the Land and Water Conservation Fund and other activities. This is not in competition with those. This is in addition to, because there's been a massive deficit in the way we've invested this for years. And so I just want to make sure that's very clear that this is, you know, um, some of Witt's folks, Paul from Witt's team has done a wonderful analysis looking at the level of conservation funding over the past 30 years. And it's gone from, in the mid-1970s, it was about 2.5% of the federal budget. Today, it's less than 1%. And the consequences of that from the way folks interact with, with wildlife, the way, that, the way that wildlife population health are kind of declining, I mean, the consequences of that lack of federal investment is staggering. And so, frankly, this is additive, um, and not just, frankly, not trying to cannibalize a small pot that's ever shrinking in these tough budget times. Thank you. Go ahead. There was one. Yeah. Uh, Jim. Jim Walker with the EDF Renewable Energy, representing the uh, renewable energy uh, industries as well as I can. They're pretty diverse. Uh, but first of all, I wanted to really appreciate the, uh, uh, the, the chairs for involving me in the commissions, for hearing this sort of set of new voices. And I'll say I, I learned a great deal, and I've been passing that on as I could to our, our leaders as well, because uh, as a result of this, we've done our own gap analysis. And while we've invested $7 million in research over the last eight years, we need to do that about every year. And so we're going to be looking at how we can address those issues as well. Thank you. That's awesome. And when we hire that program manager, we're going to reach out to you so that you can tell us who it is that we need to talk to and uh, spend some more time with. And we appreciate the role you played on the panel. Thank you. Uh, 
Nothing else on the phone? All right. Well, I will tell you it's been my privilege and honor to be associated with these folks and in my small way to have played a part in this. Thank you all for coming. I know we have some uh, items if you want to enjoy a drink and share some more conversation with our panel members who are here. Again, thank you panel members for this work. Thank you to our co-chairs, what a, what a great job. And now, now the work begins for us. Let's get her done. Keep the website but on the phone for people to get the report. What is the website? <laughs> uh, you can go to the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies website at fishwildlife.org um, and the report will be online for those of you that are on the call. Okay, thank you all for coming. Appreciate it.